So, I used to be a dumb teenager. And, as a dumb teenager, I did dumb things. And looking back, I don't know how I'm alive. This was a while back, though. Like, the 80s. And maybe I just had that dumb teenager plot armor back then, but I don't know. It's not relevant, but it does help to explain why I did some of the things I did. There was a time where I would drive from my parents' house to my grandparents' house, which was a good two-hour drive to the west through the middle of nowhere. I would do this drive weekly. I always told my parents I just wanted to spend time with my grandparents while they were still around, but honestly, there was this girl that lived across the way from them that I was very informally seeing. It was a very loose thing between us. Fun, but we both knew that it would be over in a few months. Anyways, one weekend, I was driving out that way when my car started to act up. Again, this was back in the 80s, and I wasn't much into cars beyond knowing how to change a tire. It made this weird sputtering, with a bit of steam coming out from the hood. I knew that steam meant that it was hot, so... Part of me thought I should stop for a while and just let it cool down. Again, I was not a car guy. As I stopped, I thought and tried to remember half of the things that my dad tried to tell me about cars and what was happening, but it never came to me. And that's when I saw a small farmhouse a bit down the road. I let the car roll until I was close to their driveway. It was still early afternoon, so... I figured I would park it and see if these lovely people had a phone that I could use to call my dad and ask him what I should do. Worst case scenario, they tell me to beat it, and I have to just try and make it to another house in my questionable car. I walk up the driveway towards this old house. It was a bit run down, but again, it was the middle of nowhere, and there wasn't anyone there to enforce any sort of standard. If these people wanted their house to fall apart, then by God, they could allow it to fall apart. But as I got closer to the door, my mind went from maybe they just don't care to maybe they're dead. Because this place was very much not managed in any way. The windows were all broken, and the front door was misaligned. Like the hinge had been broken off. I kind of laughed to myself, thinking, of course, I would break down in front of a creepy old abandoned farmhouse. But for some dumb reason, which does go back to me being dumb, I decided that I would check out the house, in case maybe they still did live there, and I was just being insensitive. So I knocked, and of course there was no answer so I figured I would just go ahead and check out the inside. Why, I don't really know. It sounded fun at the time, I guess, and it wasn't like I was going anywhere anytime soon. I pushed the door open and said hello like I was going to get an answer, and then stepped into the old house. It was honestly pretty creepy. All of the furniture was still there, as dusty as it was. There was an old TV set that was still there and plugged in, but it didn't work. I should know, I checked. I kept checking out the downstairs, thinking that there might be a neat treasure if I just kept looking, when I heard the soft sounds of footsteps above me. I kind of freaked out, thinking that there actually was someone there. And then I yelled out, Hey, I'm really sorry for intruding. I'm just looking for a phone to call my folks. I'm having some car troubles. As if I hadn't just seen a decade's worth of dust resting on the couch. After not getting a response, I figured I would go upstairs and see what it was. So, I took each step with a slight debate about my life choices, and when I got to the top, I froze. As I was creeping in the hallway, I swear I started to hear what sounded like a creepy giggle. As cliche as that is. It was the giggle of a young child, and it was so very subtle that I almost thought I was imagining it. Then, I saw the light. 
what looked like a literal light coming from the room at the end of the hall. It seriously looked like there was a light on, but there was obviously no power in the house. I kept on, deciding I would check it out and see what it was coming from, but when I opened the door, there was nothing there. There was no light on in there, and there was nobody in the room. Around that time, I looked up into the room and noticed a large dresser with a full mirror attached. That was neat and all, but it was what I saw in the mirror that was more important. I saw myself, sure, but I could very clearly see what looked like a person, but completely black, like they were just a shadow. Now, there was no mistaking this for an optical illusion. It was 100% a person-shaped shadow behind me, and it was walking toward me from the end of the hallway. I spun around at light speed, thinking I was going to see this thing there, but it wasn't. Around that time, I figured that I was pushing my luck. I could handle the horrors of the living world, but when you start dealing with things from the other side... Yeah, not so much. I took off down the hall, down the stairs, and out the front door, thinking that the quicker I got out of there, the better. I booked it down the driveway and jumped in my car, and by some miracle from above, it started just fine. I didn't have a single issue for the rest of the trip. It was almost like my car was supposed to break down right there so I could be scared witless by some freaky demon. I don't believe in fate like that, but it was one hell of a coincidence that I would have issues right in front of that creepy-ass house, only to not have them again after I left. To this day, I have never been back down that road. I kept going to my grandparents' house for a time after, but I found an alternative route. That experience chilled me to the core, and I have no idea what I encountered in that house. But I thank God that I never encountered it again. I'm still in shock with this one. Today, a Thursday, my teenager and I were to go to a wedding. It's an unusual day, so it stands out, at least for me. The RSVP was sent months ago. The invite has been on the fridge. The plan was to get ready once my teen got home from the half day at school, and off we would go. The bride and I are co-workers and have been talking about the upcoming date on a regular near-daily basis the last month. So, when she didn't log in for work this morning, I was all smiles thinking about her getting ready and how excited she and her fiancé were. Kiddo gets home, we grab the invite with the date, and put in the address in for the venue into my phone map. And, damn, there's a massive traffic blockage, and no way around it. We're going to be late, but we will still be there. We get ready to go. As we're about to head out, my office messenger pings on my phone. It's the bride? She's telling me how much she just got done at a job site location and had worked through lunch and is calling it a day. She has loads to tell me, but will catch me in the morning. What the hell? We reach for the physical invite that is now on the table. The date has now changed. It is now on a more normal weekend day, a subject the bride and I had talked about many times on why they had chosen Thursday ultimately, and why I had taken half a day off to be there. Which, looking in my time off request in the HR portal, that time off is no longer listed either. So, I got it back at least. My teen is just as wide-eyed. They read the date out loud when it first came in, read it again when they put it in their calendar reminders, saw it on the paper invite, reading me the address for the venue. This date was populated in our shared work calendar this morning for crying out loud. The wedding was 100% today at 3, until there was a massive wreck blocking traffic. 
and until the bride sent that message. I am shook. Update. Next day, so Friday after work. I talked to the bride first thing. Probably came at her a bit strong due to the anxiety. I didn't realize how much posting this experience here would generate that in me, but here we are. She was confused. The conversation we had in the past about how aggravating her stepmother was being, about the wedding falling on a weekday due to the date, she doesn't remember them. Still is not a fan of her stepmother, but not over this. I asked her about the special day being February 15th. This was what kept me up at night. She was quiet at first. It took a little while for her to respond. It's very much like she has no memory of telling me about why that date is so special in both her family and her fiancés. So let me explain more. Both of them have beloved family members with long-lasting marriages that happened to share the same date. They being young and in love, just thought that this was a sign, with romance, and all those couple types who are determined to make everything as perfect as the stars can align them to be can, and then she got into stubborn mode with her stepmom over it. There was drama. Multiple times there were discussions as her dad was helping to pay for the event, and the stepmother had a voice that wanted to be heard. A lot. Because of this woman, I, in turn, heard all about it. Her fiancé was at her side and her back. They faced down the discussions. They didn't care what the step-monster said. They were going to get married on a Thursday because that date was important. And now none of that ever happened. No chat logs on our messenger, I looked. Just stuff about what caterer she went with and things like that. All of that silly drama is gone. And now, well, today, she doesn't seem to even remember telling me about these matching wedding anniversaries. After a bit of chit-chat, she brushed it off as she must have told me about the matching dates at some point. How else could I have known? From her perspective, her wedding has always been set for this future weekend date. If it were not for my teen... I would have convinced myself that I was just hallucinating the whole freaky thing as an intense dream by now, and moved on. Let me repeat that I rarely drink. I do not partake. Raising a teenager is plenty of excitement and distraction at this point in my life. The teen reports nothing really changed at school that they could tell. A few have asked how no other coworkers were alerted. We work remotely. This is why the work messenger is on my phone as well as laptop for the times that I'm on one of the job sites. For those of you kind enough to ask me to check for gas leaks and my carbon monoxide detector batteries, I appreciate the concern. All three detectors are fine. We live in a temperate climate. My windows, both yesterday and today, are wide open for fresh air, so not terribly concerned about that factor. I'm going to try to make this as fast and coherent as possible. First, I just want to state that although I have a high interest in the UFO and alien topic, I am not in the business of making things up. I'm simply writing this because I want to know if someone else has had this same experience. I've researched intensively online, and although I've read similar things to my experience, Nothing has truly brought validity to mine in the level of detail that would satisfy me. Hopefully this gets around to someone who also has had this experience. I'm a musician. I make music for hobby and profit. I work as a contractor for the Navy six days a week. Very busy, and I don't have much time to be BSing around. By the way, this is not a whistleblower story. Me being a contractor for the Navy has nothing to do with this story, it's just stating my 9-to-5 for relatability, I guess. I was born in 89, 
I grew up in Long Island, New York, and that is where this encounter took place. My neighborhood is not the best, and not the worst. There was definitely an element of gangs, drug dealing, and ignorance integrated into society. Even though I blindly participated in these shenanigans, I was always naturally a peaceful brother. Eventually, I would dedicate a lot of my time researching spirituality, UFOs, and any other topics that brought us all to this subreddit. I attended a school called International Academy of Consciousness, and soon after, it would become my self-appointed duty to tell everyone in my hood about all these wonderful things, like sleep paralysis, out-of-body experiences, quantum physics, and how it can be used to explain spiritual experiences. In my eyes, spirituality is just a science we can yet measure. By the way, my encounter with these beings was not a sleep paralysis encounter. It was a fully awake and conscious physical encounter. Please bear with me, I'm not trying to be suspenseful, but I have to tell the events that led up to my encounter because I believe it is why they showed themselves to me. There was a certain feeling I would get when talking to someone from my neighborhood about these things that were rarely ever talked about. I would see the amazement in their eyes, finding out that they could also relate, but never really felt comfortable talking about it because of society. This was a feeling that I would chase. I started seeing orange orbs in the sky, falling, hovering, moving awkwardly, disappearing, reappearing. This really put me over the edge. I couldn't stop looking up at night. I noticed that they always appeared whenever I would be having these conversations with people, and I would get that feeling. They were not shy, either. Everyone would see them and be amazed. We all recorded them on our phones. I still have the recordings. This was around 2013. You can Google orange orbs on YouTube, and there are hundreds of videos of exactly what I saw. I would bring this topic up to people who are least likely to believe me, and sure enough, orange orbs would appear to prove my point. And this made their presence feel very personal to me. I would speculate that they liked the fact that I was preaching peace concepts to people who didn't think they could relate. One night, it was really getting to me that this had become a reality. I wanted to see if they would appear if I was by myself. This is hard to do in New York, considering how condensed it is. I took a walk to the nearest school. The field was dark, no lights. My plan was basically to seclude myself and ask them to show themselves. Once I got there, I started to scare myself with the thought of them actually appearing. They did not show themselves, and I didn't really stick around to find out. Two days later is when it happened. My girlfriend at the time pulled up to my house and called me to come outside. I got in the passenger side of the car. She was upset and crying about job-related issues. We were also going through a breakup. Before she got there, I was in a relatively good mood. I was trying to be supportive as possible, but I also didn't want this affecting me. There was a long, silent pause... She had her head in the steering wheel, and during this moment of silence, I was just trying to protect my energy, putting myself in an imaginary bubble. This is when it happened. I had my head down in the car. I looked up, and on top of my neighbor's house were three very tall beings. They looked like humans. Very tall, eight to nine foot tall Caucasian humans. They had blue hooded robes. Their heads were literally glowing yellowish in color, just like how saints and enlightened beings were depicted in historical art. They blended in with the trees behind them in the most unexplainable way. I'll have a picture attached that I drew the very next day. Keep in mind, this somehow had no effect on the clarity in which I saw them. It was almost as if they were being cautious of who can see them and who couldn't. There was an older being in the center. His age resembled a 50-year-old human, 
full head of white hair and connecting beard. He was smiling at me. I was in complete shock. I've never really been in shock like that. The size of them was overwhelming, and then they had the nerve to be standing on the roof. Imagine someone taller than Shaq standing on a roof. They could have pulled themselves on the roof from the ground effortlessly. And this was a one-story house, by the way. And if for some reason you're thinking this could have just been some people on the roof at night, no. There aren't many white people in the neighborhood. My neighbors were black, and they're not the type of people you could just play around on their roof at night, if you get me. Let alone the size, the blue robes, and the glowing heads. Anyway, I'm staring at the older guy in his face in amazement, but I'm also very scared. Like, in shock, kind of scared. He's smiling. He was sending me all this good energy, but... I'm so scared that I couldn't help but think of how that was kind of creepy. I quickly put my head down. I didn't know if I wanted to continue with what was going on anymore. Here's where it gets even more interesting. He talked to me telepathically. When I put my head down, he told me, Don't be afraid. It would be creepy if it was just me up here. But I'm with my family. We have families just like you do. I've never heard a voice that was not mine in my head before. This was completely different from a thought. Not only could I hear his voice, but I could hear the direction it was coming from, as if it was spoken with sound. I lifted my head to look at them again, and now there were at least seven of them. It was like he was introducing his family. This absolutely scared me just because of the overwhelming size difference. When I think about it, I get so angry at how scared I was, because they were doing everything they could to comfort me, but it just wasn't working. They all had pleasant looks on their faces, and they seemed so happy to see me. I remember getting a moment to gather myself a little bit. I put my head back down, and I said to them in my head, I know I asked for this, but I don't think I'm ready. That would be one of my biggest regrets in life ever. When I looked back up, they were gone. And the orange orbs never showed up in that fashion again. I have seen the orbs years later, but never so boldly. Never in a way that was as personal as the times before my encounter. I remember just staring in shock for a while after they were gone. My girlfriend still had her head on the steering wheel... I didn't make a sound this entire time. I started running through what just happened in my head, every detail. The encounter was relatively short, but I remember wondering how much time went by because my girlfriend didn't budge. I couldn't stop thinking about hearing his voice in my head. I heard it clear as day, yet I was speculating if he said it in English, my only known language. It almost seemed like I would have understood him no matter what language I spoke, yet at the same time I heard his voice and the direction it came from. It's very hard to explain. We went inside after a while and went to sleep. I didn't mention it to her. I only told my brother the next day. It was on my mind all night, and I was regretting telling them that I wasn't ready. The next day, I ran outside soon as I woke up. To my surprise, there were no trees behind the house where they were standing, just clear sky. This was confusing because they were blending in with the trees when I first saw them. I just sat in the grass staring at the house for a while in awe. If anyone has had this experience, please let me know. I've heard of Nordic aliens before, but... None with glowing heads. I need to know. This is a story about my daughter, Madison. Madison was our firstborn child, so everything that happened with her, we were experiencing for the first time. 
she was born healthy and just seemed like a very happy baby. One of the things I remember as a kid was when my dad laid on his back and held us in the air on his feet. We called it airplane, and we would make the sounds and everything. I loved it then, and I did it with Madison when she was a bit older too. She was always full of laughter, and her eyes were wide with amazement as we did it. As she got older and could articulate things more, she would demand to wear a hat as we played airplane. And between the little gibberish and the few words that she could speak, she would seem to try to have a whole conversation as she was flying. We just thought it was what babies did. When Maddie was about two, she would run all over the house with her arms out like she was an airplane. It was just something she liked to do. We both just thought that she enjoyed it because of us playing. But then, as she started talking and forming clearer sentences, she was saying things that didn't make sense for her age. One of her favorite things to say when she was scared or surprised was, Oh golly gosh. The first time she said it, I wasn't home. It was just my wife. She thought it was funny as she had never heard it before and asked her where she learned to say it. She said that she looked at her confused and told her, I've always said that, and then continued to play. When I got home and my wife told me what happened, I was shocked, because I had heard that before, but not from Maddie. It was something my grandfather said all the time. I never heard anyone else say it, not even someone in my family. My grandfather passed before my wife and I got together, so neither of them would have known that. There was no reason to even talk about him, really, but I did ask my parents if they had mentioned him or said that saying around Maddie, because they had watched her on occasion, but they said they hadn't. There was no reason to lie about it. He wasn't a black sheep of the family or anything. He was well-loved and severely missed, but she was too young to even know about death, so there was no reason to bring him up. Overall, we just chalked it up to a weird situation and let it go, even if she continued to say it and it threw me off. Another significant event was when she was around four. I was looking at my wife's car in the garage after she was having some troubles with it. I am not a car guru, but I know some things that my dad taught me, so I was testing things when Maddie walked in and, in her cute little voice, she asked me what I was doing. I told her that I was trying to fix Mom's car, and she asked to see. She's always been a curious kid, so I lifted her up to stand on the bumper and look into the car. She asked what happened. I tried to explain as simply as possible, because, well, you know, she's a child. And she tried to put her arm down between parts, and I told her to stop because I didn't want her to get hurt. And she put her other hand out to stop me, and said, I know what I'm doing, Mikey. I was taken aback for a couple of reasons. I had never heard her voice get so stern before. I'm her father, and she has always called me as such. My name is Michael, but not even my wife calls me Mikey. Very few people in my family do. One of those people was my grandfather. I just stared at her and watched as she struggled to reach into the car. She then pulled her arm out, exasperated, and said she couldn't reach it, but started explaining something down in the parts of the car. I put my hand in there and pulled out a clip that seemed to be warped and broken. She then explained, in a way that a child would, that it was a bad, broken part, and that it wasn't closing. I was confused, so I just thanked her, and she went back to her cute voice and walked out of the garage. I called my dad and explained to him what the car was doing, and he literally explained the exact thing that Maddie had, that the part was bad, and that it was causing an issue with the seal. In other words, not closing. I replaced the part, and the car seemed to be back to normal. 
how would my four-year-old that had never worked on a car, obviously, even know that? And know the purpose of the part? It was such a strange event. But the biggest memory that really made me realize there was something more going on here was one fourth of July night. We just had a small thing at home with the three of us. It was getting late and we were picking up as Maddie was swinging. She liked to swing pretty high and jump off the swing yelling, gear up. And then she would run around the yard like an airplane until she finally landed in the grass near us, sprawl out, and then stare up at the sky. She giggled and then said, Daddy, do you remember when I was a pilot? My wife and I just looked at each other confused. She'd never been on an airplane, or actually even seen one up close. My wife laughed and said, When would you have been a pilot, Maddie? She rolled over, looked at my wife with this kind of duh look on her face, and said, In my old life, remember? I tried to tell her that she'd only had this life and ask her what she meant. She had so much confidence in her voice as she told us that we were wrong, and that she had an old life just before she died. We didn't really know what else to say, so we just let it go. Later that night, my wife and I talked about what she said, and tried to think of every possibility. We were always open with her and any questions she asked, because she just always seemed like a really curious type of kid. She was very curious, and she wanted to know how things worked, but it was also a lot more modern stuff. Like when we got a flat screen TV, she was strangely amazed by the technology. She was amazed by the computer when I tried to search how the bulky tube TVs differed from plasma flat screens. But as we talked, we couldn't think of any shows that we had watched about death or pilots. We weren't even really religious. Not even our parents were outwardly religious, so reincarnation wasn't something that would have been talked about. Yet, here we were, and my young daughter was talking about having a past life. Now, my wife and I are very open-minded, though. Not that we expected this with our first child. So, after dinner one night, we started watching some unsolved mysteries and there happens to be an episode about reincarnation. I nudged my wife to look at Maddie, as she had stopped drawing and was watching the TV very intently. When it went to commercials, I asked, Hey Maddie, do you think that's what happened to you? She turned around surprised and said, Well, yeah, that's exactly what happened. I thought that I would try to see if she remembered anything else, so... I asked her if she remembered her name. She didn't hesitate when I asked, and she said Leo. I was shocked for multiple reasons. It was crazy to hear her give a name, but she also gave the name of my grandfather. With her using his weird little catchphrase, knowing about cars and claiming she was a pilot, that all matched my grandfather. He was in the Air Force and he was a highly regarded pilot. When he retired, he had his own little car shop that he ran out of his garage, which was how my dad had learned as well. He was also one of the few people in my family that called me Mikey. While I didn't want to ask, because a young child should not know and understand death yet, I did ask her how he died. She got up from the floor and came over to me, putting her little hand on my knee and looked me in the eyes. She had a look of pity on me, and in a lower, softer tone, she just said, I didn't kill myself, Mikey. It was my lungs. They just gave out. But I'm okay now. Then, she went and sat back down to watch TV. I tried not to let my wife see, or even Maddie see, but my eyes were admittedly filled with tears. I had to leave the room to compose myself. My grandfather had lung cancer. We all knew it. It was too far in for chemo to make a difference, so they just gave him some medications to try to make him comfortable with however much time we had left. 
my grandmother came home from an appointment to find him slumped over in his chair next to an open pill bottle, and it was assumed that he had ended his own life. He talked about how he didn't want anyone to have to take care of him, and he didn't want them to suffer through it. So, he said that he would pray that God would take him before then. That made us all think that he did it out of guilt or grief. That thought had loomed over our family for years, all of us feeling guilty for leaving him alone with his thoughts. But here my daughter was, claiming to be Leo, and telling me that it was the cancer after all, and that it was just his time to go. I was an obvious wreck, and a mix of emotions. I finally calmed down and explained to my wife, and then I called my parents again to ask if they had mentioned him at all to Maddie. They once again said no. I didn't tell them the whole thing because, again, I didn't think they would believe it and I really didn't want to upset my dad. But I held what she said very close to my heart, and it comforted me knowing that he didn't suffer and that he was okay. Maddie is now 26, and she remembers talking about it as a young child, but she said most of the memories are now gone. I think after she told us how he died, that it seemed he was finally able to move on letting Maddie live her own life. Whether she really used to be my grandfather, or there was more to this, I will never know. But I will never forget it. And I'm lucky to have such a wonderful daughter, and that second chance at a final goodbye. My name is Bill. I was driving my black Jaguar coupe home late one night several years ago. I work as a medical doctor at a hospital in Georgia, and I work long hours. Often the schedule is busy, and the work is hectic. And even though I enjoy what I do for a living, I was happy that I was driving home now to spend a full weekend with my family. The road I was traveling on was a dark and long one, but... It was thankfully fully lit up by the full moon. The full moon sure helped me in avoiding a big black bear that suddenly decided to cross the road in front of me. I put on my brakes and let the big guy pass unharmed. I watched the bear go across the road and out of sight again as I continued on my journey home, breathing a sigh of relief that neither of us were killed. It suddenly started to drizzle as I put on my windshield wipers. I was driving for about 20 minutes when, up ahead, I could see a red Toyota Camry with its emergency lights flashing on the side of the road. I hoped that there wasn't an accident up ahead, because there were animals who crossed the road without warning that could cause crack-ups at any time, like that bear that I had just avoided. When I got closer to the scene, I slowed my car down. I was concerned at first that it was an accident, but seeing none, I was relieved. Then, suddenly, seeming out of nowhere, a lady jumped out and was frantically waving for me to stop the car and help her. I could see that this lady was a nun. She was elderly, wearing round glasses on her face with a full nun's robe and a gold cross around her neck. Do you need any assistance, sister? I asked her politely after I pulled my car up behind hers and stopped it. The lady, almost pleading, was telling me that she was stranded with no cell phone signal to call a tow truck, and she was so happy that I stopped for her, since she thought her car battery had died on her. I almost told her that I would go back to town to call a tow truck for her vehicle, because I didn't want to get out of my car on a rainy and dark night to help a person I didn't know. But this was a nun, so what harm could it be, right? I then got out of my car and walked over to her Toyota Camry, telling her I would check it out for her. When I got in front of the car, I asked her to pop open the hood, so I could look inside of it. When the nun did, I could see that the car battery had green mold on it, telling me that 
This nun, indeed, would need a new battery soon. I was just about to tell her this, as I looked over at her in surprise. She was staring and smiling devilishly at me. As she quickly took off her round glasses, untied her bun of blonde hair, letting it fall loose and long all around her, and then let her robe quickly fall to the asphalt road. I was tricked. This lady was not a nun at all, but a highway robber. A blonde, bosomy, and shapely one at that, wearing a black mini-dress and pointing a snub-nosed handgun right at my stomach. She looked down, admiring her figure for a moment before looking back up at me. Not a bad figure for an older woman, huh? She laughed. A touch of actress Donna Mills with a taste of Dolly Parton. As she said this, she made herself laugh even harder. She then looked at me seriously, thinking to herself as she nodded, her head smiling at me. I was going to kill you, but I can see that you're a hard-working Joe. A uh, doctor, I see. I saw your license plate that says so over there, she said to me, pointing at my car. She then told me to hand over my wallet, which I did. I was under the gun, so I had to if I wanted to live through this. When I handed her my wallet, she took the money quickly, and then tossed it back to me just as quickly without even looking up at me. Well, thanks, lover. A thousand dollars in cash, she said quickly counting the bills. She then stared at me, smiling. I guess it's you that should be thanking me since I'm letting you live and allowing you to keep your car to boot. She said, laughing. Toodaloo, love, and don't even think about calling the police, because I'll be long gone by then. She said, smiling, as she quickly got into her Toyota Camry and roared off into the night. I tried to get her license plate number, but she was smart. She didn't have any license plates on her car. When she was gone, I drove my Jaguar immediately to the police station and told them everything that happened to me that night. I even gave a description of the lady to the police artist. Unfortunately, the lady who robbed me was never seen again. In thinking back, I should have called the so-called nun a tow truck when I got back to town, instead of getting out of my vehicle to help her that night and making myself vulnerable to attack. So, people, always go with your gut feeling. If something doesn't seem right, it probably isn't. I learned that lesson the hard way on that dark and rainy night several years ago. This story could fall under a time slip, except I went back in time, rather than forward or losing time. I had a mind-blowing experience two nights ago. We had a storm here, suddenly, out of nowhere, right around 10pm. I was still out, then it was like 0 to 60. My house was being shaken by enormous blasts of wind. Everyone else was dead asleep already. My husband and two elementary-aged kids. We'd all fallen asleep in the living room watching TV, so... Only I experienced this in my household. The wind was so hard that it thundered through our house, and I felt my ears actually pop due to the pressure change inside, despite the only air leakage capable through things like stove vents. I was actually shocked by the ferocity of the sudden windstorm, despite living in what many call Rain City, and having just two seasons here wet, stormy weather for nine months, and then a mildly hot summer for three months. This storm, though, was atypical, to say the least. I then fell asleep somehow, despite being physically shook by the storm, and somewhat unnerved by it. I woke up at 2.38 a.m. I remember because I checked the clock, and was bummed that my husband's alarm was to go off at 2.45 a.m., to get up by 3 and wake up with coffee till 4 and be out the door by 4.30, so he could be at work at 5. I wanted to get back to sleep before being reawakened by his alarms. I was drenched in sweat, 
The storms had stopped by then, and it was absolutely still and silent out. Unusually still. Not even a slight breeze or a single raindrop. I got up, changed out of my sweaty PJs, and laid back down to try to sleep before my husband's alarm. I then awoke again at 12.38 a.m., two hours earlier. Again, no sign of any storm. I then got up, got a snack, laid down, and fell asleep. But I awoke again every 15 to 20 minutes all night after that. I kept thinking, wow, this is the longest night ever. So I'd somehow gained two hours, uninvolved in any daylight savings time or anything. The clock that I check is analog. It's battery run, and the time had to be physically changed on the clock itself if needed. I checked our phone and our wall clock as well, another battery run analog clock, and again, all the times matched on each clock, and my cell phone too, when I woke up at 2.38 a.m., and then 12.38, and every 15 to 20 minutes until morning. So, WTF. How did I go back two hours to 12.38 a.m.? What's up with the weird storm? No one else in my neighborhood remembers it. They all said the same thing. I was dead asleep. Some even reported passing out at 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. Oddly early for them. In fact, they all seemed surprised by how deep they all slept. The storm did happen. Leaves, branches, and debris were blown everywhere the next morning and everything was soaking wet. Although it had stopped at 2.38 a.m., as well as zero storm activity at 12.38 a.m. Did it have anything to do with my time jump? Did we all jump together? Did I leave my dimension and join yours? I hope not. I would prefer to raise my kids from my original dimension. But again... WTF? Has anyone else ever gained time like this, rather than lost time? If so, what was your experience? And does anyone have any theories as to what happened, or any theories as to why, how, or what it means, if anything? I'm so curious, so share your thoughts with me. Hi friends, first time caller, a background for me. I'm a 29 year old American man who grew up in a conservative Christian environment. In the last decade, I've identified as a progression Christian with what I think is a more inclusive view of the world. I've admired the mystics of church history, but I never really had any experiences that I would describe as spiritual until this year. Three key shifts in my worldview have been occurring this year. First, I've started meditating, with mentorships from Christians and Buddhists, and have found it helpful. Second, I developed a joy at seeing the stars at night, and started devouring information about planets. The vastness of space and its endless possibilities are so cool to me. Third, I've been reading about non-human intelligence. I had been mildly interested in the UFO phenomenon since childhood, and always felt that there was some possibility of their reality. But the interest had lain dormant until the congressional hearings. I thought the testimonies were super cool, and I felt fairly convinced that non-human intelligence had visited and existed on the Earth. In the fall, I began poring over the CIA FOIA stuff, and watching all the documentaries, and I was fascinated. But there was never any personal connection I felt to the trend, until I started reading John Mack's book on abduction and found myself spooked. I tried to picture what it would be like to stare into the deep black eyes of a grey, and thought that it would be a frightening experience. Then, I saw someone with black eyes. I was sitting in a coffee shop, working. Two people, a tall man and a woman about a foot shorter, 
walked in and made an order. I could see tattoos peeking out of the man's shirt on his neck. Both people were wearing loose-fitting black jackets. I passed by the man on the way to the trash can and noticed his eyes. It seemed that the black outlined the edge of his iris. I thought that he must be wearing some interesting contact lenses. I returned to my spot and ventured a glance at the silver-haired woman. She locked eye contact with me with piercing eyes. At first, I noticed a milky white haze, and I wondered if she was blind. But then the blackness in her eyes became clear to me. I found it terrifying. My heart raced, and I quickly broke eye contact. I stared at the wall, refusing to engage my peripheral vision. Feeling frozen or like a rat caught in a trap, all my sense of agency disappeared. I felt so outclassed, and I knew in my heart that I didn't know what I was getting myself into with my UFO fascination. No one else in the room was reacting to them. I wondered if they had arrived just to take me. I felt intensely alone for two to three minutes. Well, they left. I asked a man next to me if he had noticed anything about their eyes. He said that he hadn't been looking. He reassured me that I may have observed colored contact lenses or dilated pupils from drug use. Later, a family member suggested that I had seen a Slara tattoo, and when I googled the image, I did find that sight terrifying. Those explanations were comforting to me in the moment, but hours later I felt still quite spooked. I felt worried that I would run into the couple again. I didn't sleep well for the next week, sensing every creaking sound in my apartment. I stopped reading Mac's book at night, had it been coloring my imagination. Despite what seemed like a negative experience, I felt the event had shown me my fear. This was a primal terror I had never felt before. Animalistic, you know? like a squirrel or a cockroach scattering away from a human. I was very frightened of going through doors. I recalled what the Greys in Mac's book had said about fear, that it stood in the way of connected consciousness, that it held us back from understanding. My Christian mind naturally went to the appearance of Gabriel to Mary and his insistence that she need not be afraid, and many other biblical stories where the human's first reaction to God, or an angel, was fear. I felt that I finally understood the cosmic terror someone would feel in the presence of a higher intelligence. And, of course, part of me felt that I needed to frame my experience in biblical terms if I wanted to ever tell my family and church friends about it. I felt very alone. I posted the coffee shop experience on the alien subreddit, but didn't get any responses. About a week later, I decided that I was going to sit out on my balcony at nighttime and stare at the stars. I hadn't done this in weeks, but I felt that it was an important step for me. I said out loud to the sky, aliens, god, or whomever was listening, I wish to understand. I admittedly was staring into the night sky in hopes of seeing a UFO, but what I initially saw was just planes or stars. Five minutes into my time on the balcony, I saw out of the corner of my eye something moving lazily downward. I looked and saw five semi-transparent orbs in a line. They might have been 25 feet above, but they were descending down and eventually over my roof and out of sight. They would have been relatively small, like the size of a drone. They weren't physically connected, but they seemed to move in harmony with one another, and perhaps moving closer to each other to merge. The translucence was surreal. It felt in my mind that this had been invisible initially, and then became visible to me. When the orbs went past my roof, and I surmised that they had landed on the ground, I couldn't see from my vantage point, the terror returned to me. Were they coming for me? 
I tried to name the fear and spoke aloud that I was sorry for being afraid, and that I was working on overcoming it. I went back inside and reached out to friends. I told them that I thought I might be losing my mind, that I was scared of an abduction happening to me while I was alone. In the days that followed, I found myself integrating the experience. For a two-week stretch, I felt deep, deep joy. A sense of being wrapped in love. Feeling that I had asked the universe for an answer, and the universe had listened to me. My family did not receive my reports well. One sibling said that although she believed in aliens too, she was concerned that I was experiencing symptoms of schizophrenia. My other sister reiterated as well that she also believes in aliens, but the fact that I'm claiming some sort of personal experience with them seems like a slippery slope. For some people, I described this using angel terminology, and that seemed to work. And while I'm open to viewing this as an angel, I don't like obscuring the full description of my experience to my family. And it grieved me that they viewed my sudden happiness as mania. I've struggled with depression for many years, and it was wonderful to feel consistently happy for that week or two. I grew up in a very religious town and family, and while I was a rebellious teen because of that reason, these events caused me to be even more shunned from my family. With that being said, I don't talk about it to just anyone, in fear that my daughter might be picked on. I don't care about me, I'm an adult and I can handle it. However, I do love hearing similar people's stories because it let me know that we aren't alone, so I would like to share this with you as well. I had two kids, one boy and one girl from a previous marriage. When I met my now husband, we wanted to try for one more kid, but I had had a miscarriage, which stopped us for trying for some time. I felt guilty like it was my fault and became depressed. But something told me that we shouldn't give up, and after some self-reflecting and healing, we started trying again. To our surprise, I was pregnant around two months later. However, that was the worst pregnancy I ever had. I had many complications, to the point that the doctor even told me that if I continued with it, that the baby may have complications. However, my husband and I persevered. Grace was born premature, but otherwise turned out to be a very healthy baby. In fact, her infant years were the easiest ones of my three kids. Our life was pretty normal from there, as much as it could be. But once Grace was old enough to talk, that was where things started to change. I would see her just stop talking or playing with her siblings, and just watch them with puzzled looks on her face. One time she did this, and I asked her what was wrong, and she said, It's all wrong. But she wouldn't elaborate. That was until I finally pushed her. She asked what happened to her baby brother. I told her that she never had one, and she told me that I was wrong, and that she had an older sister and a younger brother. As mentioned, she had an older brother and an older sister, but no younger siblings. She swore that she was the middle child, though. She even told me that I wasn't her first mom. I once again told her that she was incorrect. I was her mom. I would know because the pregnancy wasn't easy. But she replied with, Yeah, you're mom now, but I had another mom. At first... I thought maybe she watched something, and maybe a family with a middle child that she connected with, so I just let it go. But then there was another unexplained issue. She seemed to be afraid of snow. And the first time she saw it, she didn't want to touch it. And she didn't want to be in it. And the first time I tried to take her out to play in it, 
She screamed and cried until I brought her back inside and calmed her down. What kid didn't like to play in the snow? However, fears can be irrational, right? So I let it go. But since she still had to go outside to go to school, she slowly got better. But she had to be with someone at all times. She would not let go of my hand, or she wouldn't leave her siblings' sides. One day, after she came in from simply standing on the porch, making a snow castle, I asked her why she was so afraid of snow. And she replied with, Because I died in it. I just remember looking at her funny and thinking maybe she was mistaking the word died for something else. Maybe she meant she got cold, or she got sick or hurt. So I tried asking her what she meant, and when this happened. And she explained it in detail. She said she was playing with friends in the woods until she had to go home, but she got lost and didn't know how to get out. She said she was alone and scared. She said that she got really cold and really tired, so she sat down, and as she was starting to feel warm, she fell asleep. I tried asking her when this happened, and she just shrugged, saying that she didn't remember, but it was a long time ago. I asked her where this happened, and she just said, Soda. It happened in soda? What is soda? I tried asking her what that meant, and she said that she didn't know, that she just remembered that it was in soda. I sat there in silence, not knowing where to go with this, and that's when she told me that that was why she was here now. Then after she fell asleep, she got to choose a new mom, and she saw how sad I was, so she wanted to help. I was so confused, but I just let it go, not knowing what to make of any of it. But as she mentioned these things more and more, curiosity got the best of me, and I started looking into it. Maybe there was something on the news recently about someone dying in the snow, and she locked onto it, causing her to be afraid of the snow. I hadn't found any local stories of someone dying, but I did find some stories about people dying in the cold. One story I found was about a young girl that went missing for two days and was found in the snow. She had died of hypothermia. Police suspected foul play because she was found with some of her clothes having been removed. But there was no other information on this case. There were two problems with this story. This happened years prior to Grace being born, so it definitely wouldn't have been on the TV. But it also wasn't in our state. It was in Minnesota. And that's when it clicked. She was saying, Soda. She was too young to know the states, so maybe that was just something she remembered. I wanted to get to the bottom of this, so I called Grace into my office. Before I could say much, she saw the girl on the screen and got excited. She pointed and said, Hey, that's me! She started telling me more about this life, and when I mentioned Minnesota, she started jumping up and down and said, That's it! That was it! I had heard stories of past lives but never experienced it or knew anyone personally. It was the only thing that made sense to me. How else could she know about any of this? She could barely read. After looking into this case more, I was able to track down the girl's mother on Facebook. I really wanted to reach out to her to ask more, but I hesitated a lot. What if she didn't think the same way? What if I just opened old wounds again and caused her to hurt all over? But then something nagged at me to just do it so I finally did. To my surprise, the woman replied and said that she was willing to answer any questions if it meant I had any information to help. I was expecting her to call me crazy or to block me or something, but she was kind. She agreed that what Grace explained sounded like what happened to her daughter. So after talking for a while, she actually invited us to meet her in person. We lived in Nebraska at the time, so it's not like it was around the block. 
but after explaining this all to my husband, who had also been very open-minded, he thought that we should consider it. Especially if it can help not only Grace move on, but maybe even give this woman some closure. So, Grace and I took a trip up north a month later to go meet this woman, expecting to just spend the weekend there. Grace seemed to understand what we were doing, and she was excited. But when we finally got there and knocked on this woman's door, I wasn't expecting Grace to run to this woman and hug her tightly like she knew her for years. I almost cried because it seemed so natural. After talking with her, and the woman listening to Grace's story, she confirmed that it was exactly what happened to her daughter. Grace even went to her old room, without being pointed into the correct direction or getting one door wrong. It was surreal. There was no other explanation in my mind other than this being a past life. How else could she know all of this? Overall, the visit seemed to go very well for everyone involved. That woman and I became very close friends, and Grace finally lost her fear of the snow. She understood the safety in it, and making sure to not be alone and to stay bundled up, but otherwise, she went out in it as normal. We still talk about this on occasion, but it seems to just be part of Grace now instead of controlling her. But her second life gave two other people the chance to heal, and for that, I really don't need any other explanation. For as long as I can remember, I've been having this recurring dream about an old town that comes alive at night with the sights of a carnival. The dream seemed to be less detailed and short at first, but over time, I've remembered more of it and could recall more details. In the dreams, it was as if I was just walking around, taking in the sights of it all. I remember hearing people screaming from the rides. I remember the game booths and hearing the men call out to gain attention. I even remember the smell of the popcorn and funnel cakes. I went to the fair with my family before, and the dreams started after that, so at first we all thought it was just because of that. For years, I dreamt of that carnival, and all the festivities in it. I loved going to them every year too, but while some kids were upset to have to leave the fun, it always seemed more severe than that. I almost felt homesick when we left, like I was leaving something behind. The obsession with the carnival slowly increased as I grew up. I always played in my room as if I was a carny, trying to get people to join in. I would set up all these stunts for my toys and stuffed animals, and even got my siblings involved and made play money for my parents to pay and attend. I would dress as a clown, or something similar, several times for Halloween. One of my birthdays was carnival themed, and my parents set up little booths for the snacks and the games. I even got this wonderful children's play tent that looked like it came straight from the carnival. Something about it all just brought me pure joy. But then, the dreams started to shift a bit. Instead of me walking around and enjoying it, it instead appeared that I was now sitting still while others continuously walked by me. Then it seemed like those walking by would always be staring at me. They would keep walking, but everyone would glance over as they passed. I couldn't see myself, so I had no idea why. Even those dreams started with me entering the carnival, and had some pleasant parts to them too. But the more people that looked at me, the more the dreams became less wanted. The people would slow down, some would stop, some would point and laugh while others looked scared or almost like they took pity on me. I didn't understand it, but I was becoming angry. 
I wanted to shout at them to stop staring, but I couldn't bring myself to do so. I knew what to say, but I just didn't seem to have a voice. Those dreams, they started changing as I grew up. I still enjoyed the carnival, but I was much less obsessed until I started having these dreams. This made me again focus on it and question what the meaning of it all was. Did it have a meaning? Was there some kind of message behind it? Or was I just the lucky kid with a recurring dream that would just slowly drive me insane? Because I was a preteen boy, I didn't like to show my feelings or weaknesses, so I never told anyone about the shift in my dreams. My parents had even practically stopped asking about them, so I felt that they weren't important, and maybe it was best for me to just try to ignore them. But I could tell that it was affecting me mentally. The dreams would enrage me, and I would wake up in a bad mood. I seemed to pay more attention to the way people looked at me and treated me, almost to the point of paranoia and annoyance. I felt like I didn't belong. I felt like I was having more bad days than good. But this was just how I lived my life, thinking it was just me. As a teenager, my family stopped going to the carnival, so it never really crossed my mind. And that was until there was a commercial for a carnival that was going to be in town. I don't know why, but it got my attention, and I felt like I needed to go. I brought it up to my parents, asking them if they were interested, and they kind of looked at me strangely, asking why I would want to go. They also commented that they thought I grew out of it as a kid, and it really didn't answer my question. But I already knew the answer. It looked like if I wanted to go, I would be going alone. So, when the time came, I told my parents I was going to go to a friend's house for a while and then set out to the carnival alone. To my surprise, the moment I stepped onto the carnival grounds, a wave of happiness and comfort washed over me. It felt like coming home after being away for a very long time. The lights, the laughter, all the smells and the energy, everything seemed familiar. I remember just being overwhelmed with the feeling of belonging there. I didn't understand why I felt this way. I knew my obsession as a kid, but this just felt different. As I roamed around, enjoying my time, I came across a section called something like The Bizarre and Strange, and was once again drawn to it. As I walked through, I saw people like the Sword Swallower, a Contortionist, and even a Fire Juggler. And while most people would enjoy those sights, I was more focused on the spectators. Some of the things they said, or the jokes they made, put me on the offensive. Overall, though, the connection to the carnival was so strong that I felt like there had to be a reason. There had to be something other than just enjoying it. But I didn't know what. I didn't know what to do with this information or where to go with it. But then, it was like going to the carnival awakened something in me. I had another dream, but this time it was clearer. I walked by a stall with a name. Something along the lines of the Lizard Man. It was in first person, so it was as if the person was me. And I walked behind the stall and waited, as others all walked by and stared. That's when the feelings of being watched and being angry came back. When I awoke, I quickly made a note of my dream, something I had started doing. I've never gone to a carnival or circus of any sort and seen something called the Lizard Man, and I felt something telling me that there was more to this. I started researching this more, and after a lot of digging around, I finally did. There was something called a freak show back in the 20s, where it was basically a showing of people and creatures with birth defects or unique abilities. One of those people in the show went by the Lizard Man. His limbs hadn't formed properly, so they were much shorter than normal, 
and he had random patches all over his skin that were purple or gray in color, and almost scaly to the touch. People said he looked like he was a cross between a human and a lizard. Unfortunately, a lot of his personal information I couldn't find because of where he resided, and the show was not in the US, so it was all in a different language. But while I couldn't read it verbatim, I felt like I knew this person. I felt like I knew what it said. And the only thing that makes sense to me, the only thing I can seem to grasp about all of this, is that I used to be him. All of the recurring dreams about this old-timey carnival, of being behind a stall and being watched or made fun of, even all these issues and fears of people judging me and feeling like I have to be my best at all times. I feel like it really makes sense to me, and I feel like it all stems back to when I was him. My parents are both pretty religious, and their religion doesn't believe in reincarnation, so when I even brought up the idea of past lives, without even mentioning my opinion or experience, my dad laughed, and my mom told me that it all wasn't real. Needless to say, I didn't tell them about it. I did, however, tell a really close friend of mine, whose mom is really open-minded about things like that. They both believe me, and her mom mentioned how there are past-life regression therapists out there, and now I really want to go see one. I've since graduated and moved out, so now I feel like I can really focus on myself, and what I want to do with my life. I want to see if I can get more information about my possible past, but also maybe get some closure so that I can move on and live a happy, normal life now. For both of us. An incredibly weird thing just happened to me while I was sleeping. Basically, I had just had a pretty boring dream where I was doing chores around my house but then I saw my cat that had recently died, alive, just sitting there. I instantly thought this was a dream and tried to pet her before it's over, as all dreams tended to end right after I realized their dreams. But it didn't end. I looked closer at the cat to test if I was in a dream, since when I focus on something in particular in dreams, they usually end. It did not end. I slowly walked from my bathroom where the cat was sitting to the kitchen, feeling every step, thinking about if I'm in a dream, in a different world, or have gone insane. And I asked my mother if the cat we had is in good health right now as to not draw much suspicion, just in case. She said that the cat has needed a lot of care, and was saved from dying recently at the cost of not tending to carrots, but doing fine now which is kind of a weird thing to say. And then I walked to another room where a computer is located in both reality and that dream. The room was cleaner, and had some kind of brochure from a diamond processing facility for some reason. As I was about to search on the internet whether recent major political events and such had happened, at this point, being 90% convinced I'm in a parallel reality or something like that, I heard, Found you. In a previously not heard by me ever, not very masculine, but definitely male voice. And I immediately woke up. And that was weird. So I went back to lying on my bed with my eyes closed, until I suddenly continued the dream somehow, completely remembering what happened in the dream and me thinking about it. Except, I was on the outskirts of a town now. There was a weirdly small amount of cars, and a weirdly high amount of people walking. I walked towards the town while looking around. All of my dreams before that had a town in them were of places I've been to before. I have definitely never been to that place. Most buildings were two to three floors, but there were some high ones. Eventually, I stumbled upon a building with a very weird design. It had lots of metal-looking cubes on different sizes on its walls, 
the most likely decorative. I can't imagine what purpose they would serve. I decided to go inside. It looked half renovated with some walls, and a mechanical door to another part of the building looking brand new, while floors were just wooden with a pattern that is quite common. I can easily find an image of it on the internet and link to it if needed. An announcement was being said every few seconds about some newly installed AI door and other stuff about a control system being tested. There was a room with computers that looked a bit old and a lot of wooden furniture to the left. It had no door. Closer to the left was a map that I decided to look at. It was a map of this building. There was a huge vat of cesium, of weird shapes, and a bunch of smaller vats with other chemicals with longer names which I didn't have time to memorize, as the single person that was sitting in the room with computers rose up, and I quickly exited. That facility's map gave me an idea to try checking the map of the city using my phone, which probably wouldn't have worked anyways. But as I reached for my phone, a voice similar to that of my mother said, Where? And as I thought maybe my mother saw me disappear from the regular reality or something, I suddenly woke up again. My mom was still sleeping. This is very weird for multiple reasons. How was I able to see text in my dreams, especially as long as I saw? Why was I only able to wake up after some random people said found you and where? Everything was insanely detailed for a dream, and there wasn't anything so weird that it would be impossible within the laws of physics. I figured that people on this subreddit might know how to tell apart a regular dream from something that's actually weird. I had the craziest but coolest thing happen. It did happen during a dream, but it did not feel like a dream. What happened was my alarm clock woke me up, but I had stayed up late last night and was still a bit tired, so I decided to get some more sleep. Well, I heard my hubby call out my name, and I started to wake back up. I was very groggy and out of it, and was having trouble moving and getting awake. I heard him panicking, so I yelled out that I was coming. I began to think that maybe there was a fire. My this-life husband doesn't panic in emergencies. I finally threw off the covers and ran towards the stairs. Something immediately made me feel like something was off, per se. We have a hallway that leads to a staircase that is enclosed in walls. I could see downstairs. I was confused and my brain asked, where is the stair rail? We don't have one in this life. I shook my head and tried to put it out of my mind to focus. I ran down the stairs and my hubby was sitting on the stairs crying, head in his hands. This life's hubby is not very emotional, never seen him cry in 17 years. I grabbed his hands and pulled them away from his face, thinking the worst had happened. I asked him what was wrong, but I noticed he looked a bit different, just slightly, and a bit younger. Again, I was caught off guard by this, but was more concerned with what happened and if he was okay. He tried telling me what upset him, but he was whispering and upset, so it was hard to understand him. I'm very hard of hearing in this life. I shook my head and told him, let me put my ears in which is what I say when I wear my hearing aids. And then I looked downstairs to see our cat, Margot. She was standing kind of on her back legs and lifting her paw into the air and meowing in pain. She was shaking it and hopping around, and I kind of guessed that he probably stepped on her and broke her foot, and he felt bad. It was then that it just dawned on me. This isn't my timeline, and then poof, I woke up in bed. I don't know what to think. I really hope my husband is okay. I feel bad for just shifting out like that. 
Also, I do have questions. Was I actually there? Was I possessing another me's body? I do like the thought that me and him are so connected that another him called me when in need, and I went to him. But what do you guys think? Also, my husband was awake at the time. This is my first time sharing any experience online that happened to myself or anyone else. And so I'm sorry if I drag in places or if the formatting is bad. I will change names of people involved, but the places and road names will be factual. I've never shared this other than with her until now, because although I have belief in paranormal events to a certain extent, aliens, ghosts, certain legendary creatures, I'm not the type that just believes every story to be true, or want people to think I've lost my mind. It was early summer 2010. I only remember because my 21st birthday had just passed, and I was finally legal to hit the bars. It was a Friday night, and I was up having a drink at a bar that my cousin David was the bartender at. It was a small town bar that, outside of an event like a band or other entertainment was there, it usually stayed pretty quiet. It was very early in the evening, and I had just gotten out of work for the night, working at a McDonald's in another small town, less than 10 miles from the small town I lived in. I was only on my second drink of the evening when my phone rang. On the other line was a friend of mine from childhood, James. He was calling, asking if I wanted to come over to his brother's house and join them for a night of poker, beer, and weed. It sounded like a good time in my book, and since it was literally only one sip in to my second gin and tonic, I agreed to make the drive into Toledo. Most people know where Toledo is, but... For those who don't, it's a city in the northwest region of Ohio, about an hour or so south of Detroit. It was about a 20 minute drive from my small town and I figured it would be a good time. I stopped at home to grab some cash. I only ever took 10 to 20 bucks with me to the bar to make sure if I ever got caught up having a good time drinking, I didn't screw up and have too good of a time and end up closing down the bar that evening. I left my house at 11.05 p.m. I remember this distinctly because I had called James to tell him I was on my way, as they were going to wait for me and start the poker game at 11.30. We always played a tournament style of poker game, where we all put our money in at once, got equal amount of chips, and played until there was only one person left with any chips, who then got to keep all the money. I took my usual route over to his brother Eddie's house, as I have done so many times before. We had all gotten together for a group of anywhere from four to six of us, and would play poker in Eddie's basement at least twice a month, usually more. I had just gotten to the corner of Oakdale Street and East Broadway. I was sitting at a red light in an area that's nothing but residential housing outside of the elementary school, that sat at that exact corner. I'm sitting up, looking at the red light, waiting for it to change, which always seemed to take absolutely forever coming from this direction, when I noticed something in the sky that, from my vantage point, was partially hidden directly behind the red light. It was a very bright light that seemed to be pointing straight down, almost like it was a helicopter using a spotlight to identify something, but much, much brighter at the point of origin. I heard absolutely nothing after rolling my windows down, and knew this could not possibly be a helicopter, or I would absolutely be able to hear it. Wanting a better view, I pulled into the parking lot of an ice cream shop that sat directly across the road from the school that was nearby, and got out of my car to try to figure out what this thing was. When I got out of the car, I stared up into the sky and immediately found it again. It couldn't have been a plane because it didn't have the right shape. It was more oval than anything. Most stories you hear like this say that it's circular, but it was definitely an oval shape. 
I almost thought perhaps it was a blimp given the shape. But it seemed far too long to be a blimp. Even by the measurements of some everyone knows about, like the Goodyear blimp. Plus, it had no decals or identifying marks. It was either silver or grayish. After what felt to me, about 30 seconds or so of looking at this thing, my eyes started to burn. Not burn in a sense of, like, extreme burning or anything like that, but almost like that feeling of when a bug flies into your eyes and causes them to water up. I closed my eyes and began to rub them. My eyes were closed at this point, so obviously all I could see is black. After finally getting my eyes to stop bothering me, I try to look up again and find it, only for it to be gone. I looked all around, but I could not see it anymore. This is a very densely populated neighborhood with trees, houses, etc., able to obscure any view of things that you would look up in the sky to see. After a little less than a minute, I decided, oh well, time to go play poker. I get over to Eddie's house, which is about four blocks from where this had taken place, and I knock on the basement door. A few moments go by, and no one answers. I decide to go to the front door and knock. Figured maybe since I'm probably five or ten minutes early, maybe they were upstairs playing on the PS3. I knock on the door, but still no answer. I finally start knocking very loudly on the door, almost pounding. Eddie finally answers the door and says, Man, why the hell are you knocking on my door this late? I look at him honestly confused and said, Your brother said to come over and play some cards with you guys. He stares at me for what felt like an eternity, and finally responds, Yeah, man, I know he did called you five or six hours ago. It's 4.30 in the morning. How late did you think we would be playing? This scared me quite a bit, as from what I had remembered, at this moment, it could not possibly be any later than 11.25 to 11.30 at most. I attempted to play it off and say, damn man, I must have lost track of time. Can I use your bathroom before I head back home? He agrees and tells me that I should splash some water on my face, as I look like I'm either drunk or haven't slept in a week. I walk into his bathroom, and my eyes are absolutely bloodshot, and it almost looks like I have two black eyes. To this day, I have absolutely no idea what happened to me that night. I have no explanation for the lost hours worth of time. How I could have not possibly noticed that much time being passed, or how on earth something that felt like my eyes being irritated by a mosquito or, or something similar flying into my eyes. I don't want to pretend to know what it was, and try to explain it, or even assume that whatever it was that I saw that evening had anything to do with it, but it has creeped me out ever since. I love traveling and being on the road, which means that I've seen parts of the country, the US, that many people don't end up seeing. I've met some real characters on the way. When I was young, I watched a TV show on road trips along 66 and wanted to go. Unfortunately for me, I found someone who also shares my passion and is willing to travel the country with me. My fiance, John and I decided to go on the journey together. We packed up our RV with supplies and made the long journey on the road. Unfortunately, many of those places are now deserted. I've gone through Texas. Amarillo and Shamrock are two of my favorite places. One place that stood out to me with the historical buildings, and I think has the oldest cemetery on Route 66, is Alan Reed. It isn't a ghost town. I'm not sure of the exact number of residents, but there are still people living there. There's only one business that remains. We saw a couple of residents walking around, so I guess we'll have to take their word for it. Many of the older buildings are maintained by a community group who prevents the buildings from collapsing. It's pretty cool if you ask me. 
like many of these places, one thing you notice is just how quiet it is, and just how it is so deserted. We were taking photos of the different buildings in the cemetery and any of the abandoned houses that we saw. We didn't want to trespass or overstep our welcome, so we made sure these places weren't lived in anymore. Now, I want to say that we never felt like we weren't safe or unwelcomed by any means, and we didn't feel like we were being watched, threatened, etc. We looked at some of the photos on our phones, but also took professional cameras and video footage with our GoPros. Once we collected it all, we said our goodbyes and continued on with our adventure. I won't bore you with the full details of our trip, basically we had a lot of pictures and video footage. And once we got back home and finished unpacking everything, we started to go through all of the pictures to find our favorite ones to go into a photo album we would send out to our family. I know that we could post them online, but we have quite a few elderly family members who don't really have an online presence. We got up to the pictures from Alan Reed, and we noticed dust on the lens that could give the impression of a ghost orb. It kind of annoys us when we see people say that every picture has a ghost, when we know what it is. I kept finding several pictures and complained to John. He looked over my shoulder and was far quieter than usual. I asked him what was wrong and he pointed to the screen. There was a face looking at us from one of the windows. I zoomed in to see what did look like a face. Unfortunately, it didn't quite look human. The eyes were too big, and the mouth looked twisted. I'm a skeptic through and through, and I don't believe in ghosts or the supernatural. I said that it could have been a local who wanted to hide, but wanted to see what we were doing. John then said the face didn't look human. And I had to agree with him. It did not look friendly. I went through the rest of the pictures. There were some that were fine, except that same face kept showing up in different places. It got stronger and more defined in the cemetery, and John and I stared at each other. We've been to abandoned buildings, and supposedly haunted places before with no issues with any of our equipment. I don't know what will happen here. We checked the video footage and it showed what John thought was a shadow figure, but for me it looked like branches or shadowing from something else nearby. I don't know what it was. It was unsettling to know that something could be there. We did eventually manage to get some photos without the face or the shadow figures standing out. I'm still on the fence about what we actually saw in the pictures though. I looked online and spoke to some friends to see if they'd ever had a similar encounter in Alan Reed, but I couldn't find any. So, what was it? I don't know. Oh, if you want to go there, now would be a good idea. I heard recently that the last business might be packing up soon, so I suggest heading out to Alan Reed. But do keep an eye out for the weird face and shadow figures, I guess. I don't remember hearing about any local ghost stories or anything, but yeah, that's our story. I'm not sure if it's good enough to feature in a video, but I hope you have a good one, as I am a big fan of yours. One summer evening, I was driving home from the golf course. It was that time of day where the sun is in just the right spot, where you cannot see very well, even with sunglasses on. I was taking a route that I had never taken before, and was cruising along at my usual 50 miles per hour on the back roads. About 10 minutes into the drive, I looked down at the clock and it was 7.07. Just after this, I looked back up, and a stop sign came out of nowhere but it was too late. I flew straight through a stop sign at a busy intersection, avoiding cars also traveling at the 55 mile per hour speed limit coming from both ways by inches on both sides. I'm a very cautious driver, and in 15 years of driving, I have never been in as much as a fender bender. 
after this happened, I had to pull over to gather myself, because my heart was in my gut. After I got over the initial shock of almost being seriously injured, and possibly seriously injuring others, I tried to replay the event in my head. It happened extremely fast, but it made no sense that I was able to avoid the cars coming from both directions, and nobody honked or swerved or anything. And while this may seem like just a miraculous stroke of luck, I feel like there was something more to this. Now, this is where things start to make me question how or why everything happened at this particular event the way that it happened. At the time of this event, I was severely depressed. While I was not drinking, I was driving during this event. I was heavily dependent on alcohol. I had hit my rock bottom. But after this happened, things somehow started to shift in my life. Where everything was going poorly for me during the time leading up to this event, things pivoted and started going well for me right after this. For the first time in my life, I was able to get completely sober of all substances. I got an opportunity as an apprentice to work my dream job for one of the largest golf resorts in the world. My relationships with my family and friends were on the upswing. I was granted the opportunity to become a basketball coach for my local high school. Where I wasn't so lucky with intimate relationships in the past, I now had women coming at me and I didn't even have to try anymore. I felt like this wasn't my life. This wasn't the life that I had known. The only thing that felt the same in this life was my sense of self. The day of that near-miss car accident plays over and over and over in my head, and I think about it at least once a week. The thought has crossed my mind several times that I actually died in that event. And this is my purgatory, or afterlife of some sort. It has also crossed my mind that maybe I died in that accident, but my consciousness was given another chance in a parallel universe. I did some research on the significance of the time 707 as well. And while I'm not a very superstitious person, 707 is considered a mirror hour time. I don't know if I should put too much significance on this, but all I can say is that something is different about this life that I am living. Things feel off. It's hard to put my finger on what exactly is different, but so much has changed since that day that I feel like I don't even know the person that was in that near miss. I will continue to reap the benefits and opportunities that I'm granted in this universe, but somehow, they don't feel like my opportunities. They belong to a different version of me. Okay, so I have a pretty freaky story that honestly feels pretty unbelievable. I've been sitting on this story for a bit, because every time I think about it, I get a pretty major chill down my spine. Plus, I really don't know what the hell happened, and I don't think anyone is going to believe what I say. And that's fine. I'm not telling this to convince others, but I also don't want to be looked at like I'm crazy. I've heard others tell stories like this, and I've heard tons of these kinds of stories on YouTube channels like yours, but being the subject of one is a completely different feeling. So, here's how it went. I was driving back from a family visit, taking the back roads because I just personally enjoy the quiet and isolated areas. It's the kind of quiet where, if you turn the music off, all you hear is the motor rumbling. There is nothing out there, and I adore that fact. It was past midnight, as I had stuck around way later than usual, and while my mom wanted me to just sleep on the couch, I wanted to go home for whatever reason. I was regretting it a bit, and was thinking that I should have at least grabbed a cup of coffee before heading out, but it was what it was. I was driving down the road, and out of seemingly nowhere, this bright light floods the road. 
it honestly felt like a spotlight on a helicopter, but turned up to 11. My first thought was just that, a helicopter, thinking maybe the police were chasing someone and they thought that I was that person or something. So I stopped the car, thinking that things were about to get crazy. And that's when I kind of glanced up through the windshield to look and see where this helicopter was. Which was the exact moment that I realized it wasn't a helicopter. In fact, I couldn't really tell what it was. My mind kind of struggled to place a shape over this form that was above me, but I could see that it was metallic and very reflective. I couldn't quite tell if it was circular or oblong, because it was moving in a weird way. I know that doesn't make sense, but it didn't feel like the movement was natural or patterned. It was like it was glowing, but by that I mean actually glowing. Not being lit up from the inside or anything, but the outline of the shape was glowing. It was shining a light down on the road, pretty much at me, but it was seemingly just hovering beyond that. It took me a couple of moments to realize it, but while I was staring at it, everything was silent. By that, I mean that my car had shut off, and that this thing wasn't making any sound whatsoever. There was no air movement, no whooshing or whirring, just... silence. Eerie silence. For a few moments, I just sat there, frozen, my brain trying to process whether or not I could run away from this, or if I was about to succumb to some kind of painful death. I wanted to be scared, but it was more like my thoughts were TV static. A sense of anxiety, but unmoving, and I wasn't able to really form actual thoughts. Again, I know that this sounds weird, but as I was staring at this thing, it felt like I was staring at an old TV with the static just playing out behind my eyes. I just felt mentally stuck for several moments, until I seemed to regain control of my brain and shake my head. I literally shook whatever that was off, and when I blinked, it was just gone. There were no more lights, no UFO, nothing. Just me sitting in my turned off car in the middle of the road surrounded by darkness. I just sat there for a couple of moments thinking, what the hell was that, and what just happened? I started my car up without issues, and I kept on going, just driving down the road and trying to get home at like 1.30 in the morning. The whole event lasted almost no time at all, like literally. It was less than five minutes between my car shutting off and me getting back on the road. By the end of this, nothing really happened to me, I think. But for all I know, a ton could have happened in those moments where my brain filled with pins and needles. I have no idea though, but I'm no worse for wear, so if anything did happen, it doesn't seem to have affected me. It was a crazy night, and I've literally only ever told one person, my brother, and he told me I was nuts, so I've just kept this kind of thing to myself. I know what I saw and I know what I felt, and I know that it wasn't just me imagining something crazy. This isn't the most exciting story, I'm afraid, but it has me truly confused. For some context, I live in an old industrial town in Yorkshire, England, so the place is full of old mills, one of which I work in. I know the one that I work in was built in the 1870s, but I'm not sure what it manufactured. Today, the basement and a few floors are businesses while the higher floors are flats. So, on to my experience. I was doing my usual walk to work on the main road when I saw a crowd of people blocking my route. Turns out, 
There had been some sort of vehicle fire, and there was a fire truck blocking the road, which had drawn an audience. I didn't want to have to push past all of these people, and I was running a little early anyways, so I decided to try a back road, which I believed would take me the right way. I walked down the cobbled road, which turned out to be pretty short, with only a small garage on the left. I got back onto the main road, but when I did, it didn't seem right. I could see the mill that I work in in the distance, but it looked different somehow. I couldn't put my mind to what it was at first, but then it hit me. The windows to the flats on the higher levels were gone and replaced by much older ones. I thought that was pretty strange as it had the modern white ones when I was last there a few days ago, but thought maybe it was just a visual change to bring back the old look of the building. I took a couple of steps further and took a look around, and was surprised when the takeaway that is usually on the corner wasn't there, and instead it looked to be some sort of shoe repair shop. I thought this strange as the building looked very different to the one I had seen hundreds of times before. I didn't get a good look around as it was still pretty dark, as it tends to be in the British winter. Thinking I had taken the wrong route, I turned around and went back to the road I had walked down. This was all the same with the garage to my side, so I turned around again and went back. But this time the mill looked normal, and the takeaway was back. I was incredibly confused, but had to get to work. I had a pretty busy day at work, but this was always in the back of my mind. I went home and started doing some searching online about my experience, and eventually came across the concept of a time slip. I watched some videos and listened to some podcasts, and the people in these stories seemed to have similar experiences to me. I'm not 100% convinced that this is what happened, but I'm not sure how else to explain it. I can't have been that tired that I was looking at the wrong buildings, and I've never seen a shoe repair shop in that location before or since. This happened a couple of days ago now, and I'm still not sure what to think. Could this have been a time slip? I have a strange middle-of-nowhere kind of story that I wanted to send in, since you asked for them. Thank you. But this happened in quite literally the middle of nowhere. In the parts of the northern Midwest where it's just a highway and a handful of huge farmhouses and random spots. Endless roads flanked with fields that hadn't seen a sharpened lawnmower blade probably ever. And the kind you have to have a CD to listen to, as antiquated as that may sound to some. I used to have to drive this way to get from my work's head office to one of our satellite locations. It wasn't in the middle of nowhere, but I had to go there every couple of months, and this was the quickest route by car. On this trip, I was driving and thinking about where the next gas station was, thinking about grabbing coffee and filling up the tank, when I noticed what looked like a lot of flashing lights, reds and blues lighting up the early evening like a grim disco. My first thought was that there had been a massive accident. There were several emergency vehicles there, which meant it was pretty serious. Of course, I started to think about how bad the injuries would have to be to have that many vehicles there. So, I slowed down, of course. And that's what you do, right? You don't barrel through emergency situations like a madman. You take it slow so that you don't end up hitting a cop or something. As I slow down, I notice that there are even more vehicles up the way. It looks like an entrance road to a farm property... There were officers and fire trucks at the entrance, but I could make out some more flashing lights through the trees. And as I got closer, I could see the officers all standing at the entrance, like they were setting up a perimeter or something. But they all looked kind of tense. More tense than you would expect. But here's where it goes from concerning to straight-up horror. 
As I'm easing the car through this strange scene, trying to be respectfully slow, and maybe a little bit nosy, one of the officers locks eyes with me. It wasn't in a thanks for being considerate and slowing down kind of way. No, this guy sees me, pulls his firearm, and aims it straight at me. My heart obviously skips a beat and then decides to go for a sprint. I throw my hands up and stop the car, thinking maybe he mistook me for someone else. If an officer aims their weapon at you, you stop, right? You don't keep going, because that makes it look like you're running, and that makes the situation potentially deadly. But then, he shouts, Keep driving! Go! Now! All the while, he kept his weapon trained on me. So, what do you do in this situation? My mind was saying that I was supposed to stop, but he was screaming at me to go. So, I very quickly decided to just do what he was telling me and kept driving. I slammed the gas pedal, not taking my eyes off the road ahead of me. As soon as I think I'm far enough, I glance at the rear view, and he's still standing there, gun in hand, and watching me drive off like he was making sure that I was really leaving. And just like that, the whole scene was behind me. Well, physically, at least. You don't just drive away from something like that unscathed. And I was still running on an adrenaline high. I had so many questions. What were they dealing with that made it a better choice to threaten some rando on the road than just let them slowly pass? Why did he escalate to drawing his weapon immediately instead of just shouting at me to keep moving? What was so bad that seeing it meant I could not be allowed to stay? The rest of that drive, I was on autopilot, thinking that I was going to be pulled over and disappeared for something. My mind was stuck on the event, obviously, because what the hell was that? Like, even if this was a major drug bust or takedown or something, you'd think they would just block it off and wave people through, and, like I mentioned, maybe yell at them to keep going in a stern but professional manner. Whatever it was, it very clearly had that officer shaken to his core to act like that. And I'm going to be honest here, no matter how much I want to know what it was, maybe some mysteries are best left unsolved. Alright, I've been having this memory for a long time now. I started remembering only small parts since I was seven, and kept remembering bits and pieces throughout my life. I'm gonna go out and say it, this memory that I have is of the other side. There I was in a void. I could not see anything, I did not have a sense of cold or heat or emotions like anger, because I did not have a body. I was there floating at the great speed, toying and playing around since I realized that I was an orb of light. I was floating there happy, I guess in every direction, just messing around like a child. The other glimpse of my memory is that of me waiting in a line like a queue, like in an airport, waiting for check-in. And it was a white, I guess everything was white and there were other orbs like me. The other memory I have is of choosing my life. I don't know what led me to want to experience life, but I really did not want to miss out since everybody was doing it. And it was kind of like FOMO. So anyway, the choosing phase there were beings with me, male and female energy, male to my right and female to my left. I was presented with thousands of different planets, worlds to live in, like, literally, there were so many I could choose from, and it was like it was presented on a screen. In those, I saw futuristic cities, like metropolis types, and the feeling that I get from that world was that it was a very advanced civilization. And on the other screen, I saw these reptilian humanoid beings in a cave, 
or rather he just got out of the cave to view the landscape. It was night, and it was a dark blue rocky area slash world. It was overwhelming to choose just one life, and I did sense that there was a pressure to hurry up, so I was kind of recommended by the beings, guides, entities to go to the planet Earth. So then I was to decide which of the family and years I wanted to incarnate to, and what life I was going to have. There were maybe three or four options to choose from. Anyways, I was kind of interested or rather considering to choose options, but I was again recommended to choose one family over others. Or rather, I guess, I wanted to at least incarnate in the country city that was most advanced. I saw glimpses of what that life would be like, and I saw that I would get to experience life in other countries. I saw what my body would look like. So anyway, the advantages of this life would be to get to experience life in other countries, and this life would be much more relaxed in comparison to other options. But there was going to be suffering internally. Life after 20s, I guess, was going to be a struggle. And I saw that I would get to live until my 80s or 90s. I only saw, like, moments or glimpses of the life that I am living now. From the point of my orb self, I was excited for this life. I would say naive. And I knew that this was not going to be easy, but it was the easiest from the other options. I also remember telling them that I want to remember, and that there were now three beings discussing this and I couldn't perceive them or didn't know what they were saying. I didn't know if there were always three, or if it was just because I didn't notice the third one. The male one to my right did not communicate much. It was, like, professional. Like he was just doing his job. But the female one to my left was loving and caring. I also sensed other orbs too. They were like me. Choosing, I guess. I should also mention that choosing part was happening in a darkness and void area. The next memory after this is of me floating over planet Earth, and I felt like there was a pressure behind me to hurry up and through some device or pool or tube thing, I entered, or rather was sucked magnetically, and instantly the first feeling I got was fear. I was shot like a bullet to earth at great speed. I said to myself to remember this memory. I willed it that I want to remember. And there as I was being bulleted to earth, like zooming at the speed of light, from my perspective I wanted to stop and explore the earth as a floating orb, but I couldn't control the force. As I was approaching to the destination, I decided I was going to research everything about this planet and feel this freedom again. Then, there was white light, or rather a flash, signifying that I already entered the womb. And boom, darkness again. But then it was so warm and occasionally I felt that I was being fed. It was strange to me since, as me, I didn't need anything such as food, water, or air. And then after that, there was another memory of everything being blue. The other memory begins of me slowly shifting from third perspective of me perceiving my body to the first person perspective. I was excited. I ran to the mirror to see as I looked, and I realized that it was not me, and that I was in a body. I was surprised that I could move my hands for the first time. So, there you go. This is my memory from the other side. So, this strange situation happened a few years ago. I can't even remember what year, but it was maybe 2022. I was drinking a lot back then, so maybe that's what caused this, but anyway, here it is. I, 23 female, had just recently moved into a new apartment, so I wanted to have a little apartment warming with a few of my friends. We were drinking and playing card games, 
but we weren't being too loud. At least I didn't think. Just for background, I had a drinking problem back then, which meant I could drink a lot before getting drunk. I've only blacked out a handful of times in my life, and that night was absolutely not one of them. Anyways, it was early enough that I had only had a few drinks, but I wasn't even tipsy yet, and we had just started looking back at old kid shows we used to watch like Toy Castle, and pointed out just how creepy it was. I get a knock on my door, we pause the show, and I open the door to a guy that was about our age, ranging from 21 to 25. He welcomed me to the apartment, but was telling me that he worked the next day and that he lived right above me, and asked if we could keep it down a little and that he would appreciate it. It was about 7pm, and I believe it was a Thursday. However, it also may have been a Saturday because I remember being confused as to why somebody would be working the next day, but I apologized and agreed anyways. We said goodbye, and I closed the door. I remember when I got back to the table, when we were hanging out, I told my friends that I thought it was weird with him being so young like us, and it only being around 7pm that he would have an issue with our volume, even though I respected that he was working the next day. Anyways, what my friends responded to me saying this still has me messed up to this day. They all looked at me confused, and one of them had said, Young? You said he was like 50. What? I don't even remember them asking me what age he was. I said, What do you mean? He's literally our age. Another one of my friends said in confusion, We asked you who it was, and you said... I don't know, some 50-year-old guy. What? We spent the next 30 minutes to an hour going over this, and I thought they must have just been messing with me. I said, okay, seriously, if you guys are messing around, stop now and just tell me the truth. I don't even remember you guys asking me, but even if you did, why would I lie about his age? They were all serious at this point and none of them seemed like they were lying or trying to hold something back. Even years after I asked, they still stayed true to their story that night that I said he was 50. I still have no explanation, and it bothers me to this day.